Sutherland. On the BBC in Beds, Hearts and Bucks. BBC Three Counties Radio. My special guest is a bit later on in this hour. John Danzig has some fascinating stories to tell from his career as a photojournalist. And then he locked the door behind me and inside were all these crocodiles. Mm-hmm. Tell you more in a while. FM, AM and online. BBC Three Counties Radio. My very special guest, John Danzig, coming up after this real classic from Nielsen. No, I can't forget the sea. Now, John Danzig is a photojournalist who's done stories about anything from antique bottle collections to plants and flowers for a gardening magazine. He's photographed every subject from Elton John in the Bath to a workers' cooperative in the Tanzanian bush. Anyway, John came into the studios and I asked him, though he lives in Hertfordshire now, why his biog mentions him living in Florida. Many years ago I went to Florida and set up my business there as a freelance foreign correspondent. And a lot of fun that was too. How on earth do you go to somewhere like Florida as an Englishman and then set up a business like that? I mean, first of all, you've got to make contacts and things. I was very lucky to have got the support of quite a few editors of newspapers who gave me letters and and that way I was able to get a visa to uh, live in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed quite a lot of interesting people. A woman who'd been on a UFO, we interviewed her under hypnosis. Really? And uh, she (laughs) described the inside of this spaceship so thoroughly that I was incredibly impressed press but I was only in my early 20s then I asked the doctor he hypnotized her what he thought and he said well if I could see her for six weeks I think I could cure her <laughs> I'm surprised the hypnotist didn't put you under as well didn't he you had a job <laughs> Almost there you are. now um, it was an unusual career choice really I mean not many people decide to become a photojournalist but even before you were 23 you had a portfolio full of interviews uh, with internationally known figures I've seen um, copies of some of them they're brilliant Tell us about your sort of transition from being a student to becoming a professional. I think people would love to know because it's a difficult thing, isn't it? Yes, I think for young people it is sometimes difficult to know what you want to do. Earlier on I wanted to be a private detective. As it turns out later, that did become quite useful. But I knew from the age of 14 I wanted to be a journalist. That was for sure. And at about 17 I launched a magazine in Hertfordshire called Yam. And that was quite successful. And I'd knocked on the door of the editor of the Watford Observer and I said, look, your newspaper's hardly got anything about young people in this paper and I'd like to do a page every week. It was an audacious suggestion (laughs) and I didn't think he would say yes and he didn't say yes. But I harangued him for a while and then he saw the magazine I produced and he said yes. And so every week... As a teenager, I edited a page called Accent on Youth in the Watford Observer, and it was very successful. Lots of young people contributed to it, and I even interviewed the Prime Minister for it. Oh, really? Prime Minister of the day? Yes. Yes, yeah. Uh, But Yam itself, going back to the magazine, you were still a a student yourself whilst you were running that magazine. Yes, that's right. And that that was also quite successful. It was successful. What I did, I just put a, an advert in the local paper saying, I want to start a magazine. I'd like budding young journalists and photographers to come along. And before I knew it, my house was full of 30 people and my mum was making coffee for them all. <laughs> and uh, all these people were ever so excited to be making our own little magazine. It yeah. was great fun. And for those days, it was ahead of its time. It had a nice, glossy, colourful cover. And for an amateur magazine, well, you can't go an amateur, but you were still an amateur at the time. Beforehand, I had done magazines for a cycling club I'd done called The Wheel Spinners. Mm. And we went cycling all over the country. In fact, at the age of 13, I'd done this uh, little business where we bought bicycles from boot sales. And then we did them up, repainted them and sold them. And then we used the money to go on holidays. And so we had done magazines for that. So I had a bit of experience already yeah but it was a hundred steps ahead of a sort of school mag or anything like that it was um, very professional i've seen copies of it so i know it's um, it was well I, I remember being interviewed on late night extra on bbc radio 2 when i just yeah. launched the magazine as a surprise they had harold evans on there <laughs> to give me some advice and he gave me some of the best advice i had uh, then as, as a budding uh, new coming journalist yeah yeah and now it's your turn to start giving advice to the new young people coming in and i'm very happy to do so yeah yeah how does it work are you assigned a story by a magazine or do you send your own stuff to the agencies when i was doing freelance journalism Mm. i had to go out and look for the stories i looked through the local papers i'd I'd 
be out there. I think you've got to be interested in people. You've got to be interested in life. And I'm sure you know that yeah. yourself. So, for example, I uh, saw in the local paper in uh, Florida about this man who invented the Nautilus exercise equipment, Arthur Jones. He died a, a few years ago. Very interesting character. But I had no idea what I was going to let myself in for. I rang him up and he said, yes, meet me in the House of Pancakes. Or meet me in the House of Pancakes <laughs> at 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I went to see him and he swaggered in and to he told me that he was the most educated man I'd ever met. And I was <laughs> he told the, you that. He told me that. <laughs> yeah. He ordered his eggs sunny side up with his yeah. French fries. And then when he finished, he told me to follow him. He went in his Cadillac. I went in my Datsun Honeybee. And we went to his factory. And he showed me around. And we got to this big shed. And he prodded me in, in the chest and said, you mustn't write about anything inside this shed in America. Well, I said, well, that's all right. I'm, I'm writing for the British press. He said, well, in you go, lad. And I went in and he locked the door behind me. And inside were all these crocodiles. He kept his pets. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it was a bit of a shock, I have to admit. <laughs> but I'm here to tell the tale. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you are, really. A shed full of crocodiles. Could you imagine it? You light the skies up above me. Take that, rule the world. Back to my guest, John Danzig, in just a moment or two. And uh, although he's had a fascinating career, just of late, life hasn't been all that easy for him, as, as we shall find out after this. Early Almond, BBC Three Counties Radio. Your career was sort of, um, it came to a bit of a halt because you were ill for quite a while and in fact you're still trying to get over that, aren't you? Yes, unfortunately mm. I had a condition which was a non-cancerous tumour in my head which was really very serious and I'm yeah. still trying to recover from that. I'm obviously still very keen to get back but it was a big blow. Yeah, yeah, it's a sh it's great shame because you'd really started to make your mark to say the least. My last film production was my most successful and if I'd carried on with that I feel I would have yeah. had much greater success but these things happen in life and it's how you get over it that yeah. really counts uh, but my last film production was called people power at work and it had sue lawley and john humphreys presenting it and also the late brian redhead who i got on with very well i yeah. loved working with with these people and uh, we did films about best business practice how to get the best out of your staff at work and that was a very successful series so you'd swapped well not swapped permanently because you're still a very keen photographer but you'd swap to video as against the still camera for a while eh? well i was working at bbc radio 4 as an investigative journalist on roger cook's program there called checkpoint yeah. so i was a newspaper girl then i had done some photography and one day i went out and bought myself a video camera it was just a domestic vhs video camera yeah. and i went back to the office and we messed around with it i thought this is fun then a couple of weeks later i went to see my friend steve skinner in leeds and we made a little film we'd never made a film before we shot it in one day all edited in the camera called the man with a mountain on his head <laughs> and uh, it was such a lot of fun uh, it was obviously an amateur film and i saw in the local watford paper that the watford uh, film club were going to have a film competition so i thought well i might as well enter and i went there and, and they were very snobbish they said we don't have video here because the video was quite new then they said, <laughs> we're purists here we only have film well, I said, well, come on, this is the new up-and-coming thing. Well, they were very, very reluctant. But eventually they said, yes, OK, we'll have your video in. I was the only video that they'd ever had and the only video in the competition. And I'm pleased to say it won first prize. <laughs> so I never looked back. We jump forward a bit because I mentioned in the intro about the photograph of uh, Elton John in the bath and um, there's another one that I really love. It's a laundry day involves a balancing act for one Italian woman and she's a, an Italian peasant lady, I think. Um, and that's a very serious shot. And then obviously the Elton John in the bath. You, you better tell us the story of the Elton John in the bath, at least, I think. Yes, <laughs> well, I, I knew that Elton John was going to be at Watford Football Club. I haven't really properly used a camera before. This is really in your early days then. Yeah, it was quite one. early yeah. on. Mm. And I went to hire a camera from a local shop called Hammond's. I did, it was a great, huge camera. It was really quite scary. It had lots of buttons on it, and I wasn't quite sure how to use it. <laughs> well, obviously, I'm a risk taker. So I went along, and there was Elton John in the bath. Uh, Rod Stewart was in another bath next door. This was at Watford Football Club, where they had baths instead of showers. And mm. I managed to click the right buttons at the right time, and out came a picture of Elton John in the bath, which was published all over the world. And that was my first professional photo. 
<laughs> so very lucky indeed. He was quite happy about that, I presume. Yes, I sent him a New Year's card with a picture on it saying, I hope you have a clean, happy New Year or something. And he wrote back <laughs> and said he was, he, he was quite chuffed by that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, when you're a, a, a freelance journalist, I imagine you can follow a lead for days only to find that somebody got there before you. You have to be quite resilient when you're a freelance because mm. things can go wrong. And of course, that can be expensive. I remember being fascinated by the astronauts who went to the moon. And uh, I heard from NASA, I said, I'd like to talk to them. So what? Well, it's funny you should say that because we're having a reunion next week. <laughs> they invited me to their reunion. So I drove all the way from Florida to Texas only to discover when I got there that they'd given me the wrong date and the party had been the day before. Uh -huh. And I, I spent a couple of days being quite depressed and then, you know, I had to turn it around. I think, well, how can I make a bad thing into something good? So I went back to the NASA press office and said, look, you've let me down. I need now to go and meet these astronauts at their homes and you need to facilitate it. And in the end they said yes. So I went to meet quite a few of the astronauts at their homes yeah. and I did a big story called What on Earth Are They Doing? Oh, great. <laughs> I did mention the uh, picture of the cooperative workers meeting happening out of doors in Tanzania and because what I didn't ask you is why on earth were you in Tanzania in the first place? Well it's a good question because with a group of friends in Oxford we'd started a campaign called Campaign Co-op and I went out to Tanzania to find out about coffee picking there and to arrange to export from Tanzania about three tonnes of coffee not to make any money but really to educate the British people about the poverty of the coffee pickers and we sold about 20,000 jars of coffee with a pack and with a book called The World in Your Coffee Cup, basically as an educational process. And that was the kernel of the start of fair trade in this country. So I didn't start fair trade, but with my group of friends, we started the idea yeah. that you could sell coffee and be politically responsible for the purchases that you make in the shops. And it's just ironic that coffee keeps us going in our fast materialistic world. And yet it's a real grind for the people who have to pick it because they're generally very poor. Yeah, yeah. And look how fair trade is now caught on. So you started something unwittingly, but I, you started I, something Well, I like to think good. that, that yeah. with my friends, we, we started the kernel of an idea. Yeah. Now, that was a very serious story, which is a far cry, really, from your story of the south of France, I have a feeling. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, when you offer yourself as a filmmaker, and uh, my slogan in the early days of my business was, if it moves, we'll shoot it. And uh, <laughs> I had a phone call from a company, a British company, who do new discs holidays in the south of France and they asked if I would make a little film about it and uh, I didn't wait long to say yes that sounds very <laughs> interesting actually but uh, they did also ask me whether I would be prepared to film uh, naked myself mm. and rather foolishly I said the first thing that came into my head which was what with all my equipment <laughs> it was quite bizarre to go to France and see people shopping naked in the supermarket. I'd never seen anything like that before, and I wouldn't expect to see that again in Sainsbury's, for example. <laughs> I do hope you don't, and I hope I don't either. <laughs> My guest today is John Danzig. He's a photojournalist, and I wondered which of the many celebrities he'd photographed stuck in his mind for any reason at all. I think you have to be interested in people, so they all stick in my mind. And I enjoy interviewing people and talking to people just as you do. And yeah. I was very proud that a photograph I took of Margaret Mead at the United Nations, because I did quite a lot of work with the United Nations. Mm. She was a famous anthropologist, and my photograph was used to mint a coin, special coin, in her memory. So I was very proud of that. Oh, absolutely. That's a lovely story. Um, was the film with Sue Lawley your first film? or? Well, no, it was my film? last film. But oh. uh, my first film was when I went to the office and my, uh, with my new video camera and shot uh, in the office of the BBC <laughs> Radio. But then I went uh, on from that. And, and when I left BBC Radio, I was very lucky because I went to the John Dickinson company that make paper in Hemel Hempstead. And I suggested to them, why didn't you have a little documentary made about paper? And they thought, well, we never thought of such a thing. Yes, let's, let's do it. And I was very lucky. I hadn't got any film to show them that was any good. <laughs> but uh, I showed them a script. And I remember 
again hiring the video camera, this great big camera the night before and spending most of the night reading the manual. How on earth does this thing work? <laughs> I went along and we did the filming. I'd not used a professional camera before, but it came out okay. And uh, they were very proud of this film and they showed it all over the country. And I, I've just uploaded the film to my new YouTube channel and it's got quite a lot of hits, quite a lot of people to be interesting. Apart from anything else, the paper factory is currently this minute being knocked down yeah. to make way for new housing. So it is a very important part of our history and also sad because it's the loss of manufacturing. It's fascinating. So we can see this film on YouTube then? Yes, I've created a new YouTube channel. I'm starting to put some of my film work up on there. I've got my first film there, The Man with the Mountain on His Head and The Paper People, which is the film about paper manufacturing, right through to People Power, which was my last film series presented by Sue Lawley and John Humphreys. Well, let's hope it's not your last. Cause, uh, no, yeah. let's say I haven't done my, my best work yet. <laughs> let's be positive. <laughs> You've done some good work, though. One of my favourites is uh, the picture of the two nuns clock-watching outside the Vatican, and uh, I already mentioned the Italian peasant woman with a pile of laundry baskets. Probably give you as much job satisfaction as the showbiz one, some of those pictures, don't they? Well, probably more so, because yeah. these are real people, and uh, I find that very interesting. One of the biggest projects I did in terms of writing a newspaper was to edit a newspaper for the United Nations called Yes, But What Can I Do? And that involved me going around most of Europe talking to action groups about what they want to do to make the world a better place. It might seem idealistic, but these were real practical groups doing things on pollution and hunger and environment and things like that. And uh, the newspaper was very popular and financed by the United Nations and sent around the world. I was responsible for editing the paper. We had someone go around America, someone go around Australia. Uh, we didn't do Eastern Europe. We couldn't get oh. in there so easily <laughs> then. But yes, it was a very successful paper and it's still referred to today. I, I was going to say you must have been the first editor that had to be very careful about political correctness. Well, definitely, because for the United Nations Population Conference, I was given the task to try and work out how could we print a newspaper there. And uh, this was in the times of the communist days. Sometimes some of the political cartoons we saw were altered overnight because <laughs> they weren't approved of. Oh, dear. <laughs> now, you must never miss an opportunity for a story like uh, the time you had a bicycle accident yourself. Do you remember that? I, that, I think do. that was back in your Florida days, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I was I was a bit foolish. I'd gone shopping at the local supermarket. I was hanging my shopping basket on the bike as I was riding along and I fell off. But what was more shocking than that is that I lay in the road unconscious for quite a long time and no one would stop to help me. And eventually I did get up and walk a distance back to my apartment and my neighbours were so shocked and they took me to the hospital where they charged by the stitch. This is private medicine, <laughs> not the NHS. And uh, One large one, please. <laughs> yes. And, and when I said, oh, gosh, how can I explain this uh, bicycle accident? They said to me, well, just tell people you've been in a sword fight, which seemed fine to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you did the article on the expensive um, health care in America, didn't you, after that? Yes, it, it was mm. quite shocking. I mm. mean, there was a story where someone had been unconscious in New York and the ambulance men didn't take the person away because they didn't have any credit card or cash on him. We sometimes don't count our blessings in this country, do we? Well, I, I obviously, yeah. I've benefited from socialised yeah. medicine. And I think it's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. So you've edited um, international newspapers. You've made films. You've been a very successful photojournalist. Well, you still are all of those things. What on earth is next for the Danzig camera? <laughs> well, that's it. I'm, I'm still recovering. I'm still looking at uh, what I can do next. My YouTube channel, which can be seen by going to eyesears.com. Oh, that's a lovely title. I'm just right there. Eyesears.com. Eyesears.com. You can see some of my films, and I'm pushing at the boundaries of what I can do because I haven't been so well, and so it's not been easy, but I haven't given up. No, no. good for you. Good for you. Well, um, hopefully, you'll be back in in months saying, this has happened. <laughs> yes, I shall look forward to meeting you again. John Danzig, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Ernie Armand on the BBC in Beds, Hearts and Box. BBC Three Counties Radio.